Today I am at Start Bay Sediment Subcell. Start Bay is located on the south coast of England in the county of Devon. The area is characterised by miles of sand and shingle beaches. It's a dynamic coastline with coastal communities vulnerable to winter storms. Careful management is needed to mitigate damage. The focus for this will be on possible geography investigations, on physical processes, perhaps longshore drift and erosion, and also on the management possibilities. Some background information will be added for context. Let's start by looking at a map and considering some of the processes going on here in this bay. Right, let's begin with a bit of an overview. We've got hard rocks in the south of Start Bay. There here is uh, schist, if you can make that out. That's a metamorphic rock. It creates a headland. And we've got Start Point there as the end of the headland. There's other erosional features, uh, caves and, and stumps. As we move further up the coast, we move into slates. There's some, a little bit of sandstone in here as well. Other major physical features to highlight are going to be the lee, the lay, which is the, the lake, which is here in blue. And that is separated from the sea via the barrier beach which is a ridge of sand and shingle that sits, sits in, in there in between. We also have human features, the A379 that, cont that crucially runs along the barrier beach through Torcross, then off inland. There is Slapton Village, there is Torcross, Sunnydale, which is a tiny settlement, there is B Sands and the abandoned Hall Sands. Let's talk next about Fetch. So on the south coast of Britain, Weather systems, waves, certainly big destructive waves, tend to come in from the southwest. Now, I'll just pull that off. We can have a look at this map here. This is underneath um, from the southwest, but Start Bay is just there. So we'd be interested in waves coming in from the east in this location, as you can see here. Now, Start Bay is protected from anything coming in from the southwest. And what happens is the waves will refract around the headland and produce low energy waves as they round that headland and move up north up towards Start Bay. So the storm waves, as I say, from the east provide that threat. Any threat there is in terms of erosion and of flood risk, they are going to be the storms coming in from the east, from this direction. Longshore drift on this piece of coastline moves from south to north. The sediment moves up towards the north in general. This leads us to think about the possible investigations that could exist on this beach. So we could think about sediment moving north. Does the sediment moving north produce us wider beaches up here compared to narrower beaches down here? And does the nature of the sediment change as we move along? Does it get more rounded? Because we've got this zigzag pattern of longshore drift, therefore the sediment is taking a long time to move up there. There's going to be erosional processes happening as it moves. It's going to be subject to attrition where the rocks are going to be bashing together. Do they therefore, as we move up here, get smaller? Do they therefore get more rounded? Perhaps they do. Perhaps all of that is going to be because of attrition. So how do we how do we investigate all those things? Well, do we think about beach profiles as we move along? Think about measuring the width of the beach. Um, can we think about getting some calipers to look at size of sediment as perhaps we move up up the beach? Um, can we use Powers Roundness Index? So there's one uh, by Caliu as well. We've also possibly got the potential to look at using sediment sieves to start um, to sieve the sediment, look for sizes to sort the sediment. And maybe we can think about using spearman rank to look for changes as we move up the beach. Lastly then, looking at the map, let's see about some coastal management. So here we can see some shoreline management plan approaches, and they are highlighted using the colours along the coastline. So Torcross and B Sands are both hold the line. They've got seawall, there's rock armour, a little bit of evidence of gabions, and certainly in the case of the A379, there's some a little bit of sheet piling just north of Torcross, uh, just in here. So we could look at the effectiveness of the management and the impact it has on natural processes and perhaps even the need for this management. How could we do that? Well, cost-benefit analysis, bipolar. Uh, we could look at the rock armour using the Hudson's equation. I'm at the southern end of the barrier beach now, just in front of Torcross. You can see behind me the recurved sea wall where I've just been sheltering because it started raining and some rock armour in front. Let's talk about the barrier beach, the bar. These terms are a little bit interchangeable. This is a shingle ridge 
which runs across this part of the bay from Tor Cross, where I am, to further north of me at Slapton. The ridge has a lake or a lagoon called Slapton Lay, Slapton Lee, trapped behind it, which is now which is a protected freshwater ecosystem with national nature reserve status. Many barrier beaches or bars are created by longshore drift. But to understand the origins of this beach, we have to go back in time 20,000 years to the maximal extent of the last ice age. Now during glaciations, we get disruption to the water cycle, meaning that more water is stored on the land as ice. It is still being evaporated from the sea, but doesn't make its way back into the rivers in the same quantities. Therefore, over thousands of years, we get sea level fall. This means that 20,000 years ago, the coastline here was not where it is today. It was about 30 kilometers off the current shoreline. As we've exited the ice age, the sea levels have been rising, the sediment has been rolled onto the land, and this is why the ridge is in its current location today. It also helps us to understand that it's not a fixed and permanent feature. It's dynamic, it's moving, and it's still being rolled inland further. The fact that Barrier Beach has moved so much and so far means we get lots of different types of rocks on the beach. There is, and the reason why the beach has got this kind of orangey color is there's lots of flint here. Um, that's from offshore. There's also slate, which is the, lo the local rock underneath much of this area. There's granite from up on Dartmoor, on the hills. Uh, granite is an igneous rock, and that's been brought to the surface by a batholith. There's also schist uh, from start point further down the coast behind me, and quartzite from just offshore. At the south end of the barrier beach, we have the village here of Tor Cross. This contains many businesses, and Tor Cross has had sea defences since 1944. Their installation, by the way, coincided with the D-Day rehearsals Exercise Tiger. The Germans discovered this exercise and 946 American servicemen lost their lives when the beach was torpedoed. Vital to the socio-economic success and sustainability of this area is the road that runs along the bar, along the barrier beach. This is the A379. It links Knightsbridge and Dartmouth. I said before the barrier beach is moving, it is dynamic. It's been rolled inland for three reasons. First of all, we've got rising sea levels. Sea levels have risen 20 centimetres in the last century. Maybe they'll rise a lot more in the coming century. We've also got longshore drift going south to north, and we've got storms, which combined with high tides produce erosion. When the wind blows in from the east, we get the biggest waves here. These processes between them mean the barrier beach is getting thinner. This is happening because it's being stretched. It's pinned at each end, but in the middle, it's being rolled inland. So therefore, any bit of it is getting thinner. So what does the future hold for the road and the community served by this area? Is it cost effective to keep repairing the road? Sea defences can be so expensive. They hold back the sea, but can we do it for a long period of time? The cost would be huge. Can the road be repaired? The barrier beach can be reprofiled and it can be recharged at relatively modest cost in terms of defences. In 1980, a sea wall which protects Tor Cross was installed, this one here, um, but the barrier beach is largely undefended further up, up towards the north. Damage occurs periodically. Uh, March 1918, Storm Emma caused a significant amount of damage, meaning two and a half million pounds had to, be, had to be spent and the funding came from central government. Included in these repairs was a 90 metre long new stretch of sheet piling north of Tor Cross, just up there. The coast at these sands now, looking back towards Start Point. Now around the corner, just out of view, is Hall Sands. In the 1890s, it was decided to expand the naval dockyard at Plymouth. Sand and gravel was needed for this and dredging began off the coast of Hall Sands on Skerry's Bank. 600,000 tonnes was removed and the beach levels began to drop. In 1900, the seawall began to disintegrate. By 1902, concern was so significant that the dredging licence was revoked. The sediment budget was affected and sediment levels still do not have not recovered to this day. Hall Sands was largely destroyed in 1917. The sea ripped houses off the cliff and over the course of a few hours, and it destroyed almost all of the fishing village. It now provides us with a stark reminder of the power of the sea. And also, that if we mess with nature, as we did in the 1890s, we do so at our own peril.
This is the rock armour which has been installed in front of B-Sands at great expense. Was it worth it? Well possibly. House prices are very high here. Right Move tells me that a four bed house is currently on the market in B-Sands for over £800,000. This is the tiny village of Sunnydale. What we can see here is the road that gets to it and it's not a road, it's just a tiny track. There's only a few small houses here and you need a 4x4 vehicle to be able to get to it. The locals have installed their own defences. They got permission, um, the shoreline management plan allowed it, and some uh, gabion baskets essentially have been uh, put in front of the uh, cliffs in order to defend this piece of coastline. As of 2022, they haven't really been tested yet.